Hello and welcome to What the Bible Says podcast, where we seek to find answers to the questions that you ask. The goal for every podcast is to answer questions only using the Bible, as we believe the Bible is still relevant to answer questions today. Although some of the volunteers in this group attend local churches, we are not supported by any church or denomination in any way, shape, or form. We receive no funding from any congregation or organizations. Let's search together what the Bible says. Hello, I'm Donnie Rader, and I want to again thank you for joining us for this podcast. This is the second in the series of nine studies wherein we're raising the question, is my church the one that is in the Bible? And so let's get underway with another study, the second in the series, is my church the one that was in the Bible? Let's focus on worship. In this study, in the previous lesson, we talked about there being one church, the church that meets the pattern that's found in the New Testament. But let's raise some questions about worship. Let's talk about why we sing, why we have congregational singing, and why we don't use instrumental music in worship. Let's answer those two questions. And let's start with the matter of singing. So why should a church in their worship engage in congregational singing and why is it we sing praises and what is it that we are to be singing and who is to sing? Let's answer those questions. Let's talk about singing that pleases God. In the book of Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19, the apostle Paul says, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. And so here we have a passage that tells us what we're to do in our worship. Speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual song, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Colossians 3.16 says essentially the same thing. A little different wording. The book of Ephesians, the book of Colossians are parallel books. And so here's something very similar. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. Now, let's draw some conclusions about the singing that pleases God. First, this is congregational singing. In other words, we're singing together as a group. How do we know that? These passages talk about speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So we don't have a special singing group, a choir, or a performance group that is singing for our entertainment, or they're singing for our edification, but we're speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Now what is to be sung? These are spiritual songs in their nature. Psalms, such as we have in the book of Psalms, those were songs that were sung to praise God. A hymn is a religious song that is primarily a song of praise, and then songs that are spiritual in their nature. So secular music, such as patriotic music, which is great, or maybe it's country or rock or whatever it may be, Those kinds of songs are not appropriate for our worship unto God. God specified psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So that's why we sing. The church you read about in the New Testament is a church that when they come together, the congregation as a whole will sing, and they're singing spiritual songs, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So let's talk about why we don't use mechanical instruments of music in worship. Let's begin with this. It is not because we do not like instrumental music. It's not that there are some groups that like instrumental music and others that just don't like it, and that's why we don't have it, no. Nor is it because we can't afford it. It's not that some churches oppose having an organ or a piano because they can't afford that. 
nor is it because we've never had it before. Those are not the reasons for opposing the use of mechanical instruments of music. So let's answer the question. Why don't we, uh, why, why don't we use instrumental music in worship? Number one, there is no Bible authority for it. We must have Bible authority for all that we do in religion. You see, God, because He is God, has authority over man. In Genesis 1 and verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So God created the heavens and the earth. God, because He is Creator, has authority over man. So God, because He is God, has authority over man. So we must have authority for all that we do. In fact, God Himself tells us that we must abide by His authority. Colossians 3, 17. Now that's the next verse after the verse we just read a moment ago at Colossians 3 and 16. So let's go to Colossians 3 and notice in chapter 3 and in verse 17. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. So whatever we do in word or deed that we are to do in the name of the Lord. Acts 4 and verse 7 shows that to do something in the name of another means by their authority. So whatever we do in word, in our teaching, or deed, our practice, must be by the authority of the Lord. Second John verse 9. This is a passage we noticed in our previous podcast. This passage says that we must abide within the doctrine of Christ. So we must find our practice, our teaching, within the confines of the revelation of God within the Bible. We must have Bible authority. There is no Bible authority for mechanical instruments of music. Let's talk about a second principle. We don't use mechanical instruments of music in worship because God's silence is prohibitive. Silence, the silence of God, is not authority. In other words, many have the idea that if God did not forbid something, if God did not tell me not to, that gives me liberty to do whatever I want. There is a concept, let's talk about two opposing concepts. There is one that says the silence of God is permissive. That's what we just described. That means we're at liberty to do what is not specifically condemned. If God did not tell me not to do something, then I'm at liberty to do whatever I want. There is an opposing concept that says the silence of God is prohibitive, meaning we are forbidden to act without authority. Which one of those is correct? Well, let's look at Hebrews chapter 7 and in verse 14. There the Hebrew writer says, For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. Now, what do you learn from that? What I learned from that is Jesus came out of the tribe of Judah. What did God say about those of the tribe of Judah being priests? Our Lord spoke nothing concerning priesthood. But chapter 8 of Hebrews says, If he were on earth, he could not be a priest on earth. So I'm learning from that the silence of God is not permissive. The silence of God is prohibitive. So if the Bible is silent about using mechanical instruments of music, using pianos and organs and uh, bands and brass instruments and string instruments in worship unto God in the New Testament, then there is no Bible authority for it. No Bible authority, God's silence is prohibitive. Here's a third reason. God specified 
singing. God specified singing. When it comes to music, singing is all that God has authorized. Let's quickly notice nine New Testament passages that would use the word sing, sang, or sung, or the equivalent thereof. In Matthew 26, 30, they sung a hymn. The parallel account, Mark 14, 26, they sung. Acts 16, 25, Paul and Silas sang. Romans 15, 9, I will sing. 1 Corinthians 14, 15, I will sing with the Spirit and I will sing with the understanding. Ephesians 5, 19, we noted that passage earlier, singing and making melody in your heart. Colossians 3, 16, the other passage that we noted earlier, singing and making melody in your heart. Hebrews 2 and 12 talks about sing. Hebrews 13, 15, here is an equivalent phrase, offering to God the fruit of our lips. So notice, when the Bible addresses the question of, of music and worship, what God addresses is sing, sang, or sung, or singing, or fruit of the lips. Singing is all that God has authorized. Now, James 5 and verse 13 again uses the term sing. Now, Let's talk about the difference in generic and specific authority. And so what I want us to notice is God has specified singing. Now we just noted those passages that dealt with singing. Now let's notice a principle. When God leaves a matter in the generic, man is at liberty to choose the specifics. But when God has specified, man no longer can choose the specifics. You say, how do you know? Well, let's take some examples. In Genesis 6, 14, God told Noah to build an ark. Had God told Noah to build an ark of wood, Noah would have been at liberty to choose any kind of wood. But God didn't leave it in the generic wood. God specified gopher wood. That means he could not use any other kind of wood except gopher. When God is specified, man no longer can choose the generic. All right, let's take another case. The washing seven times in the river of Jordan, the case of Naaman in 2 Kings 5. God told through the prophet, God told Naaman to go dip seven times in the river, had God said just dip in the river and didn't specify a river, any river would do. But in that God specified through the prophet, the Jordan River, that meant he could not use any other river. In fact, Naaman recognized that because he raised the question in 2 Kings 5, are not the Abana and the Farpa rivers better than all the rivers of Damascus? He understood God had specified the Jordan River. He was no longer at liberty to choose the river. Just like Noah could not choose the wood anymore. Well, there's an offering mentioned in Leviticus 14. Had God left that in the generic animal, any animal would do a lamb, a goat, bull, a camel. But in that God specified lamb, then no other animal would suffice for that offering. When God specifies, man is not at liberty to choose the specifics anymore. We see that in the case of the wood, the river, the animal. Now let's come to the matter of praise and music. Had God said, praise me with music, man would be at liberty to choose any kind of music. But in that God specified the type of music, sing, that eliminates us using any other form of music because God specified singing. Now you understand that. If I said to you, in, in matters of secular things, 
They're not even religious. If I sent you to the store with my money and tell you to buy me a cola, you would be at liberty to choose any kind of cola. It might be a Pepsi Cola, a Coca Cola, or RC Cola, or some other kind of cola. But if I specify Pepsi, that eliminates you buying anything else than what I have specified. Now let's consider a fourth principle. Instrumental music is an addition to the Word of God. Instrumental music is an addition. We must not add to nor take from the Word of God. We must not add to nor take from the Word of God. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, let's consider Deuteronomy chapter 4. And what I want you to notice about this passage is that Deuteronomy 4 and verse 2 is not the very beginning of the text, but it's in the beginning section of the Bible. That is, it's in the Pentateuch. It's in the books of Moses. So early in the Bible, we have this warning that you shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take anything from it. Don't add to, don't take from the word of God. Well, in Numbers chapter 22 and in verse 18, Balaam said to the servants of Balak, I cannot go beyond the word word of the Lord my God to do less or more. That's interesting now. I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. That should be our attitude. I'm not going to add to or take from the word of God. The Revelation 22 verses 18 and 19 is at the end of the Bible. At the beginning of the Bible, Deuteronomy, and at the end of the Bible, the same warning. Here's the warning. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds these things, adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of the prophecy, book of prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and from the holy city and from the things that are written in this book. So just as we had in Deuteronomy, we cannot add to nor take from the revelation. Now let's notice a difference between aids and additions. Now I want you to notice with me that instrumental music is an addition to the Word of God and not an aid. Now watch the difference in aids and additions. An addition involves another element being added. Let that sink in. An addition involves another element being added. Now let's illustrate. Let's take the command to eat bread. That is the Lord's Supper, 1 Corinthians 11. We might use a table we might use plates. And when we use a table to put the Lord's Supper upon, or we use plates to disseminate the Lord's Supper, or we use cups and containers, we're doing nothing more than what God said. But suppose we put blackberry jam on the Lord's Supper, or we put beef on the table for the Lord's Supper, or we put cola instead of the fruit of the vine, now we have another element being added and that constitutes an addition. We noted the passages that say we cannot add to the Word of God. All right, we see the difference in aids and additions. Well, let's go to this matter of baptize. What about bab baptizing? Well, in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, we're to go baptize, all, uh, teach all nations, baptizing them. Now, in the command to baptize, we might use a baptistry, or we could use a creek, or we could use a river, or we could use a lake. We might use a heater to heat the water to make it more comfortable to baptize. When we use a baptistry or a heater, we're doing nothing more than what God said. But when we 
for example, sprinkle and use that as a form of baptism, now we have another element added that's a different thing than immersion, which is what baptism is, and now we have an addition to the Word of God. Let's take the command to build the ark. We talked about that a moment ago. Genesis 6, 14, God told Noah to build an ark. He might use a tool or an animal to help in the building. He might use an elephant to drag the building materials to the building site. He might use a tool to help make the building of the ark. And when he uses a tool or an animal, he's doing nothing more than what God said. Those are aids. But suppose now, instead of using, uh, or in addition to using gopher wood, he uses oak or cedar or walnut or whatever it may be. Now we have another element that is added and that constitutes an addition. Now let's take the matter of singing. God commanded us to sing. We all know that, Ephesians 5 and verse 19. We might use song books. We might use a computer and a projector to project the hymns upon a screen that we might see. We might use a tuning device, a pitch pipe on our phones to get the right pitch. And when we're doing that, we're doing nothing more than what God said. But when we have instru mechanical instruments of music, now we have another element that has been added in addition to singing, and that is contrary to the Scriptures. Aids are authorized within the command. Additions are another element that, be, that is being added. Let's take the contribution of 1 Corinthians chapter 16. We might use a basket to collect the collection. We might use a bank account to hold the money before we spend it. But in that 1 Corinthians 16, stipulated the first day of the week, now when we do that on Monday or Saturday, we have another element added. We're going to use a basket to collect the money. That's an aid because aids are authorized within the command. We're doing nothing more than what God said. But when we have an additional element being added, now we have an addition. Now, let's draw a parallel here. As we're continuing to talk about instrumental music as an addition, if we can have one of these that I'm about to mention, then we can have the other. On the one side, we have the mechanical instruments of music. We have a piano, an organ, or whatever you want to consider as the instrumental music in worship. On the other side is putting blackberry jam or strawberry jelly up on the Lord's Supper bread. And what I'm suggesting is if we can have one, we can have the other. If not, why not? Now, someone says, well, I like instrumental music. Well, I might say I like the strawberry or blackberry jam on the bread. The fact that I like it doesn't mean God's pleased with that. Someone may say it's just an aid. All the mechanical instruments of music does is aid us so that we can sing better. All right, the, the jelly or the jam just aids us in partaking of the bread, makes it more tasteful. Someone said, well, it helps the singing. Well, this also helps the Lord's Supper. Or one might say, God didn't say not to have the mechanical instruments of music. Where's the passage that forbids it? And I might say that where is the passage where God said not to have the strawberry jam or the blackberry jam on the Lord's Supper bread. If we can have one, we can have the other. Now, what have we seen in the study? What we've answered the question is the worship that God accepts when it comes to music. We saw in Ephesians 5, Colossians 3, that God specifies singing, congregational singing, singing of spiritual hymns, Thought songs that are psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. But why do we not use mechanical instruments of music in worship? Because there's no Bible authority for it, number one. Number two, God's silence is prohibitive. 
Number three, God has specified singing. And fourthly, instrumental music is an addition to the Word of God. We thank you for paying attention to this study. We encourage you to take the passages that you have listened to. Go back and listen again. Take those passages, read them, compare what you've heard with what you read in your Bible, and then conclude from that what God would have you to believe. We encourage you to follow up with the next study as we continue to talk about, is my church the one that is in the Bible?